So it's hot. If you have been outside in the last few days experiencing 106, 108, it's roasty. It's real bad. This is not the worst summer we've had, but this is the worst of this particular summer, which has actually been pretty comparatively gentle, which is a weird way to talk about 90 and rainy, but you take what you can get in Austin, Texas. But apparently too hot for one Alexander spot talk. Josh Wolf was talking on Thursday to us at practice and was talking a little bit about the high performance team, making them get off the field at 10 15, because after that, then it's ridiculous to be out there. Josh said, we can always say how we use the heat to our advantage, but when you're in it for four months, it starts to have a cumulative effect, I think the other direction. And then talked about spot talk, basically that's interfering with his match readiness, right? Just wanted to get him close to the group in Leaks Cup, even though we hinted that he might be getting some minutes against LAFC. That was a little bit of a smoke screen, we assume now. And basically he's talking about it when he's training. Spot talk is not happy <laughs> apparently with the heat. Josh said specifically, he's not used to and not comfortable in the heat yet, which is understandable, but at the same time, it's a little concerning. Sounds like he won't be playing now until the home match against Vancouver a week from tomorrow as we record this. I foresaw this as being an issue that they were going to have to deal with because when you're dealing with a completely different climate like this, it takes time to mm -hmm. just acclimate to what your body naturally does to regulate temperature whether you're running around a soccer pitch or not. And I think that there there is something to the notion that maybe the club's kind of performance folks didn't anticipate. Like, the, I, I think they're anticipating the actual, like, practice and training thing. But mm -hmm. the maybe just go sit outside on your porch. Maybe just, you know, go for walks. Nothing too stressful. Nothing too strenuous. Teach your body mm -hmm. to hydrate. And the gods have listened to the needs of Alexander, uh, Alexander Svatok because the clouds have opened over here near Palmer Field and St. David's Performance Center. It's thundering. It's raining That's as wild. we record oh, this. Wow. So it's, it's not doing that in my neck of the woods. It's it, it's a divine sign that Svatok must play. <laughs> but I can relate a little bit. So this yeah. kind of harkens me back to a time, 1994. I first moved to Austin in the summer, decide one day <laughs> to pretty, pretty early into my stint here, like a few days after all the boxes are unloaded. I want to check out the neighborhood, living in West Campus. So I, I walk down the drag on an August day at three in the afternoon <laughs> and I wonder, where is everybody? Why is nobody out? And then I realized, yeah, they're all inside in the yeah. AC. Emergency podcast. Better do the thing, so we gotta talk about it. Emergency podcast. It's an emergency. Emergency podcast. Shut up, hurry up, shut up, hurry up, shut up. Emergency podcast. It's an emergency. Hey, hearty hello to you and welcome to Emergency Podcast, the Austin FC podcast, where we talk about all the Austin FC emergencies that are happening. The current one, of course, being nine games left in the season. Are they going to make the playoffs? Are they not going to make the playoffs? Obviously, that's been the big burning question all season, but now it comes down to they are in 10th. They are on the outside looking in. We talked about our projections last week. I was a little grim and dismal and Moises was very rosy and optimistic. Moises, are you still holding to that optimism that you had, which I think was more, you couched it as more of a hopeful, this would really be good for the fans than, yes, this is conclusively I mean, what I think is going to happen. I, th I think it'd be good for the fans. It'd be good for the players. It's sure. it, it's uh, the results in League's Cup, I think, gave them a beachhead that they felt like they could actually operate from where they could mm -hmm. see light at the end of what was previously an endless tunnel. But yeah, I think less rosy glasses are too hopeful or, or something like that than looking at it from the, if it isn't this. For me, if they don't start on a solid run of momentum, it's not mm -hmm. going to be pretty. It's just yeah. not going to be pretty because when you have major players that it directly affects when they are doing real not well, like Drew Yusey, that's what they need. And I feel like the season starts in September as many people, even MLS employees who are employed as pundits are fond of saying the season, the season really starts in September. Austin FC started its season a little early in July. 
others you know mm-hmm. acted like they were playing a, a full division one season of soccer going back to february apparently but but Whoa, austin fc you can do that yeah i some people choose choose their fates and that's certainly a fate to choose yeah i'm sticking with the Nashville result has got to be a win I feel like no matter what, and I touched on this a little, not that Josh actually pays attention to anything other than the notes he's given about what we say that are passed to him by his many Ministry of Information agents uh, that keep him apprised so that he doesn't have to troll Reddit. But in the press conference, I alluded to the algebra, maybe the calculus of points that are needed, which games they absolutely need to win, can win, which ones Mm -hmm. they're going for a tie, it feels like this first one out of the gate is one that he will be willing to be flexible on tactics in ways that yeah. we bafflingly saw him not do against LAFC and League's Cup, but that may result in delivering the win in Nashville that they really need. And I think that they're vulnerable. I think that them being out of form in League's Cup and then having mm-hmm. a good chunk of time off I seriously doubt that helped BJ Callahan and his guys get to where they are going to treat Austin like anything other than a visiting team from the other conference that they don't need to win against in their minds. I feel like there's going to be a certain amount of, honestly, Monterey Pumas style complacency of it's Austin. Come on. Come on. <laughs> well, we'll see. On. We'll see. It's- they do have a history. They do know each other. Of course, Nashville was in the West in 22 during that kind of epic MVP stretch run. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they also might think, okay, we're at home. We can get this fairly easily. And I do think that, yeah, I, th- I do think this is a gettable three points for Austin. So I do think that they are going to come with it. And obviously we've seen them on the road kind of play more conservative. And I don't necessarily think that's going to happen here, just given what Nashville has done this season and some of their challenges and struggles. But I wanted to get into, I found this really interesting. So Brendan Hines, like we were talking about his toenails, his bruised toenail beds and Colby from the Statesman offering tales about his toenails, oh which maybe didn't add. It added something. It, it added, it added some, I don't know. What is the word? What is the word I'm looking at? It's just some, some personality to the proceedings. Yeah, I don't know. That's I, it. I, that's it. That's yeah. I, we grew why, closer. Why are you think about this, Phil? <laughs> he actually said some really interesting things. I asked about that kind of defense heavy approach that he, that that Austin used to beat Pumas and Monterey. I called it perhaps League's Cup's most surprising group stage showing. That was a fair assessment. And, um, you know, I mentioned later, I was like, look, I, I think you guys know people did not expect you guys to win those games, um, mm-hmm. which I was saying from the, the lofty position of a uh, guy who said <laughs> that they were going to win both of those games, but I'm sure came off as, you guys are basically terrible and nobody expected you to do that, including me. But it, it was interesting the way that he took it as, yeah, here's what we did. And I think that's how we've discovered we get tactics talk out of the official availabilities because Josh isn't going to talk about them, but the players will. Boy, will Ethan Finley Mm -hmm. hold forth, and apparently so will Brandon Einzai. Yeah, we'll occasionally get it from Josh, but that's often more post-match when something worked. Pre-match, yeah, he usually doesn't give anything up. But I thought this was interesting. I'm just going to, I'm going to read the quote. If you haven't seen it in Verde All Day, of course, it's there, but wanted to share it here in audio form so you can appreciate what he's saying. I thought, I think it's interesting and I got a couple thoughts on this. So let's go with the quote first. I think first and foremost, we're a possession oriented team. And I think we're all guys that want to have the ball. So I think that's never the game plan I would say is to not have the ball, but I think sometimes it calls for it in terms of being in a more condensed block, which we were against those two Mexican teams and knowing how good they were with the ball. We didn't want to get played through in the wrong way. And I think we were tight in our spaces and we transitioned them well. And not to say we don't want to play like that, but I think having had that as practice and preparation for what we might have to deal with in some of the road games, especially now in the last nine to go, I think that was good to know that we have both styles that we can implement. So I think that's interesting because, again, we have seen them be more compact and more defensive in some of the earlier season games, but the offense didn't really accompany the defense in those games, especially those road games. And now we're seeing that I think they're learning more and more. And I think as Bukhari gets integrated, that they will be able to counter out of that and create more chances. Their numbers in terms of progressive passes and final third passes are still pretty dismal, but I think those can improve as they they do more of this sort of play. And then again, you saw against LAFC more what they quote unquote want to do, but 
again, having possession does not necessarily result in victories for this team. So although that's the philosophy, and again, Game State has things to do with possession. So it's not just purely, yeah, we want the ball, we're going to seed the ball. But when they have more of the ball, it doesn't necessarily correlate with more points per game. So that is something that is is curious to see. But Hindsight did talk about mm. needing to get some road results. And yeah, I'm, re- I'm really curious to see how they come out. Are they going to be more expansive? Are they going to be forward? Or mm-hmm. are they going to try to lock up Hanny and Sam Surridge and then go the other way on select plays and use that counter and make Jodas Park uh, a little <laughs> more quiet? And I want to preface this by saying this is not me trying to give Josh Wolf some flowers as some sort of like master tactician or strategist or something like that. But Mm -hmm. I'll stick with what I said previously. And I I knew that I wasn't going to get some sort of a direct answer by directly addressing it with Josh or one of his players, but I was sideways trying to get what we got out of Brendan about the tactics that, that are being used and what they know they need to do. Because my assumption is that Josh looked at that LAFC game as we really need to win against them when it comes to season points. We do not need to win against them right now. And if I have to choose between one of the two, because the way that their roster is stacked, I I completely, I think there is track record to establish that Josh Wolf would make the strategic choice to go, I'm going to use bad tactics against them in a cup competition I don't care about. And apparently thousands of people do not care about because there are thousands of unsold tickets to the final at the moment as we record this. I'm going to- Because we've gonna, seen it before, but we'll get uh, to that. Yeah, it is It is him going, this is how I coach against Chirondolo. When I need that win against Chirondolo, I am going to reserve what I need to do to be able to beat the coach. Because this is not a thing where he's going to throw his roster at their roster and come out on top because- even with the additions, LAFC is stacked into the stratosphere. This mm-hmm. is uh, the the way that LAFC home win went in 2022. That was coach versus coach. That wasn't roster versus roster. That was Josh playing a, against Torondolo, assuming yeah. that it was not going to be that tough of a thing. And I think that there it, it's fair to look at some more analysis along those lines when it comes to the longer lived coaches in the league of which Josh is right up there with Peter Vermees as, as the Highlanders of the league, the the, the, most tenured coach right now. I feel like that's what we're really looking at, even though we were not going to get that answer out of Josh about, Oh, a shift in tactics based on how things went during leagues cup. He knew how things were going to go during leagues cup. He absolutely knew. Yeah. That's curious because he does talk about how, He thought that game went fairly well. Essentially, they got countered two times and that was it. But Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot that he liked about that. But also the way that he coached. And again, I think to say that he threw that game is I'm not saying necessarily where we are going. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We want to caution against that. But yeah, I do think that he felt maybe. Again, this was, to me, this felt like too cute. This felt, Mm -hmm. okay, LAFC expects us to play the way we did against Monterey and Pumas, and they've got tape on that. So we're going to do the opposite, and we're going to be way more forward, and Bukhari's back, and we're going to see what he can do. And to a certain degree, that worked. But again, they couldn't get final shots off. They were not scoring when they needed to. Josh definitely talked about that. And LAFC was able to put two away on the counters like we talked about. But also LAFC really has liked playing that way this year. They will sit back and absorb and then use their speed and counter. And then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, really fast, yeah. really good attackers <laughs> in our face running downhill. That's not good. So they, yeah, they, think... they soak it up and then they wring out the sponge. Yeah. So I think that it's going to be interesting to see. I would like, I think like you, I think what you're saying is that you do expect more of a approach that they used against Monterey and Pumas when they return and Mm -hmm. dare LAFC's attackers to break them down and try to force them into a lot of kind of low percentage shots rather than. We got a half dozen other things to talk about, of course, but it bears mentioning, look at what LAFC's schedule is going to look like. Josh knows this. Mm -hmm. Josh is fully aware of this. They are going to have to play a, a League's Cup final. They have a semifinal Open Cup game days later. Starfire. At Starfire, where they are the visiting team, and they're going to beat And Seattle. boy, are they visiting. 
boy, are they visiting. I doubt it's not Seattle, anything they're really familiar with. I doubt Seattle wins that, but it's not going to be a pleasant experience for them. There's a lot of meat grinding that LAFC is going to go through between now and when Austin plays them again. And Josh yeah. is relying on their guys being more tired than his guys. And I him actually meet, see Seattle pulling that out. I think there is a possibility they will. It'll be more interesting mm-hmm. than any of the knockout round stuff that we've seen very recently in League's Cup. I, you know, uh, this could be a U.S. Open Cup podcast and it would have dozens of listeners. But <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you that Seattle could pull that out. But I think I think the more interesting overall narrative situation is LAFC wins League's Cup, wins Open Cup and mm. is has been the leading contender for MLS Cup. And with Apple picking up the late round broadcast rights for US Open Cup, that feels to me like a thumb on the scale from Daddy Warbucks, Daddy Apple Bucks, as it were, on going US Open Cup matters. You're gonna you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna do this this thing where you try to doom it into obscurity because Apple's gonna back up the Brinks truck and encounter what you want of course it would be better it would be better for open cup if lafc seattle was the final because you have sure would skc indy on the other side of the bracket which is again if indy wins then you have a cup set underdog story but indy's probably going to get smoked by either of those teams and Massively. then if you have the skc i think skc is certainly capable of putting a good 90 minutes together and they've got a history and all that. But yeah, I do think whoever wins LAFC Seattle is going to win. Open Absolutely Cup. has to. I it w- I would be shocked for it to go the other way. And it would be hilarious for the narrative to be that Open Cup had a better overall final couple rounds than League's Cup did. League's Cup, which <laughs> I mean, nobody's watching. The diehard of the diehards of the clubs that are still in are watching. Nobody else cares. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have your semifinals in direct conflict with the Democratic National Convention, which I think a lot more people were probably watching. So. And you had uh, most of your tournament up against the Olympics. Yeah. People have something else good. to watch. People have something right. else to watch. If that's a preview for how they plan to schedule against the World Cup, oh boy, is Ooh. that going to not go yeah. well for them. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine they're going to try to counter program against World Cup. They they, they could not possibly right. because Messi calls enough shots to prevent such right. a thing. I don't happening. think FIFA lets. I don't think FIFA, and FIFA lets won't let them play during. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This you is bring, kind of so. you, you bring in the soccer one world government and and yeah they are the ultimate trump card. God, what an but unfortunate imagine how word fun it would that be is. If now. they tried. You, you can't even use certain metaphors anymore uh, when it comes to to card playing. But yeah, when when it comes to card playing. We've got a bunch of schedule congestion thanks to cup competitions and cup competitions that cause rescheduling of league play where LAFC had a match move to October that was going to be here within the next little bit. Yeah, and that's going to be during the international window. I think it's an international window that's between the penultimate and the final game Mm -hmm. on decision day for pretty much everybody else. And it's against Vancouver. So there's also playoff yeah. implications there pretty late in the season. Yeah, I think I think that it is going to be a more interesting last nine games than a lot of people give credit to it being. I think there's a lot of autopilot going on with expectations where the the folks that, that did deep cup runs, they are going to have schedule congestion. They are going to go hard in those cup finals, and that is going to affect their play, and that's going to affect the rest of the table because who is going to pick up those points that are available when these top teams are vulnerable. RSL doesn't have that problem. LAFC does. Yeah. Galaxy doesn't really have that problem either. So, nope. yeah. So that's going to be interesting in terms of who tops the West, Supporter Shield, all that. So, obviously, I think Miami's in the driver's seat for mm-hmm. Supporter Shield. And I still consider them a cup favorite right now. But, I would agree. Uh, I would agree. They're, uh, they're, it, but LAFC is right there. Them, well. LAFC. LA Galaxy, I didn't believe I would say that at this time last year. Oh, I know. But yeah, I think it's possible. And I think that with the jockeying for the prime positions up at the top of the table, there Mm -hmm. is that opportunity to get in there in the middle of the above the playoff line pack. And on the one hand, it's Josh mentioned in a previous press conference that his wife will tell you that his work-life balance is not great. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, if I were fighting for my job, that I I would be doing the same thing. I totally get it. Yeah. I yeah. think that not only is making the playoffs the line, 
it is that they've got to make the playoffs and they've got to make it in better than the play-in position and better at the very bottom of the table because then the playoffs are totally miserable and it's cool you did the bare minimum i don't think yeah i don't think he care to be fair i don't think he cares about the fan base's position i think he cares about how his players feel about it and yeah. if he's going to continue in this job he has to do something to retain the locker room as much as you know it's not hangout vibes fc the way that it was where everybody was pals and they were you know they were drinking mate together doing a video podcast there is still a very familial quality to the guys that are in this group, you know, the guys who have come in, maybe not all of them are part of uh, what I consider the South American crew who chum up really tight, who are really close. It it seems like a very friendly overall locker room vibe across oh, yeah. cultural differences, language differences. Locker room is in chaos. Talk is, it's an easy thing for people to say from the outside just based on looking at the play and going, well, that must be the cause of it. I'm not right. seeing that, and none of these guys are that yeah. good of actors, and I'll just point to any of the many commercials they've been doing. They're not great actors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not putting this on. These guys want to win, and and yeah, I'm sticking to what can be labeled as the optimistic, maybe too optimistic by half, position that they're going to they're going to similar to the monterey pumas upsets they are going to surprise mm -hmm. people in these first few games yeah maybe they don't yeah. necessarily win every single one of them but they will defy expectations granted the bars in hell <laughs> ultimately wolf is not an ogre as a coach and the no. training facilities are really nice and the fans are fantastic and austin's a great place to live so i feel like they're all pretty happy this is a pretty good mls team to land on so I Phil, think, you didn't I even mention that... the domain. <laughs> this episode brought to you by the domain. Have you ever wanted to, to crawl around an outdoor mall in your Bugatti at three miles an hour? The domain. <laughs> Welcome to Austin. Welcome to downtown Austin, as some people would have you believe. My thanks Second to the ever. domain for sponsoring this episode of Verde All Day's Emergency Podcast. <laughs> Phil, what do we got next? I want to talk a little bit about Nashville. Ben Wright to time to do three questions for us. It's a really good writer. Did a lot of stuff for the league where I crossed paths with him. And then he is now with Tom Bogert over at Give Me Sport. They're doing a, a refresh on their MLS coverage and he's great. And he was with uh, Backhield for a while too. He's really good. And he's from Nashville. Got to talk to him about just some of the various burning questions that we had. First of all, you're aware, Drew C has had a down year in terms of his goals and assists. So is Hani Mukhtar, although Mukhtar did make the all-star team again. And obviously is still an elite level player. It's just been weird. Ben said that he thinks midfield's fault basically. They've had struggles in midfield. Nobody can consistently progress the ball. See if that sounds familiar. And then Mukhtar's receiving it farther away from goal. And this is much less effective. Trying to do too much, taking shots from poor angle, ignoring open teammates. So I don't know. Does this remind you of anything? Uh, I mean, it feels like living the doppelganger life. It's, you know, the same different side of the same coin. And it's mm -hmm. interesting, you know, looking at it historically, having been there for every beat of that 2022 campaign yeah. and watching that go so well and watching what has happened since go not so well for both of these outfits nashville opened that beautiful new stadium and they've had trouble filling it more often than not they were boasting about its upward capacity thirty thousand, and attendance seems to have fallen off when they're not in yeah, a crazy run of form this is, again, when you wonder, could Austin have built their stadium bigger? Let's say they'd gone 30,000. Would we be seeing maybe a, obviously we'd be seeing an emptier stadium because unless you adjust ticket prices and things like that. But How much uh, emptier would that Monterey Pumas game have been? You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 20,000 20, feels like a good yeah. size for Austin still. Yeah. Obviously, one, so you talk about these teams, obviously, they're both below the playoff line right now. Definitely, they've got potential. Obviously, when you have Mukhtar on Nashville, when you have Drusi on Austin, even though their number's down, obviously, they're still capable of good things. Austin's kind of reset, trying to 
save the season as it were i think is the trio of players that they got in the summer transfer window uh for nashville they had a coach change gary smith was josh wolf's counterpart and that he was the only coach that nashville had ever known they sacked him i believe it was in may and then brought in bj callahan who is formerly the u.s national team had that nation's league run Berhalter tree Yes, yes. And Wright is impressed with what Callahan has done so far, said specifically, he's incredibly meticulous and has a clear vision for how he wants to play that I think should be quite effective once he's had more time. He wants to be a high pressing team, but also one that looks to break down teams with the ball, play passes to forward facing players and create high value chances. And then he said, yeah, that's what every coach wants to do, but seems like he's actually got a clear plan for how to get there. And then again, wondering about can the roster do what he's looking for them to do, which sounds similar to what we've seen with Wolf over time. So trying to play this really possession heavy style and maybe not having necessarily all the pieces that allow you to do that. But I do think that's interesting. Again, we are pretty early into Callahan's tenure, so he is still trying to figure things out. But at the same time, there's that recognition they're in 12th, but they're not so far off of ninth. So with a few wins starting against, dare we say it, against Austin, if they can pull that off, then maybe they're off to the races and maybe they get themselves into the playoffs again. So yeah, so I do think that, again, like you were talking earlier about maybe Nashville is taking Austin lightly, but I think also there is going to be a motivation. I think for both teams, yeah. what I said before, that there is this perception of this gettable three points on both sides. And you have in Callahan, a coach that's really trying to prove himself. And in Wolf, obviously, you have a coach that playoffs are the goal and his job may be contingent on it. Yeah, it's not as hard of a climb winning against Vancouver at home when you're coming off of a road win against Nashville. That's the momentum Wolf has got to be looking for. And yeah, that's what they've got to be going for. They could not possibly, uh, in, in all of the things that people have classed as bizarre coming from Wolf saying, we don't need to win this. Oh, we needed the draw for that or whatever. Could not mm -hmm. possibly be going to Nashville for the draw. They're going there for the dub. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause down the road, there's road games. If you look at, okay, if they lose against the galaxy, that's expected. There's still two weeks to prepare for Colorado at that point. So like a loss there isn't necessarily as bad of a road loss as say they do lose to Nashville, which is this winnable game. It's supposed to be the one that kind of sets all that momentum in motion. That's really concerning. Again, I think must win should only really apply to you win this or you're out of the playoffs, but mm -hmm. a really nice to win sort of yeah. game is how I see this for Austin. Yeah. I think the expectation beating vibes coming out of Monterey and Pumas, the time that mm -hmm. these guys have had, to further train together and look at the nine game campaign. I think that's going to contribute to a lot, but we Phil, two weeks in a row. We got breaking news, terrible news for Austin. What chances of a win dashed. Matt Bersano is out. Matt Bersano yeah. is out for tomorrow <laughs> with a lower leg injury. Oh, that's mean. Don't do him like that. Bill, <laughs> Bill, who are they going to not sub in ever to save the game? No, I, I, Matt, I, I, I like Matt Bersano. It's just, has he played a competitive minute all season? No, that's why the joke. That's literally the only reason. Right, sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I saw that and it's okay. So the only person injured for Austin right now is the third string goalkeeper. That's great. That's you look at Nashville and Nash Nashville's got a ton of injuries. They're yeah. not necessarily key core players, but they're definitely rotational players. They're players that you would see in, in matches. So you, know, you look at that versus what Austin brings a full healthy squad. That's again, League's Cup forced rested. Mm -hmm. as many teams are. Nashville, certainly that as well, but they're obviously thinner right now, numbers wise, than Austin, who basically is bringing everybody. Because, yeah, that's the thing. Like, Persano doesn't even really make the 20 unless no. it's like, oh, we have to fill a roster and we're not going to need a third goalkeeper, but we might as well have him here because crazy things can happen. Who knows? Right. And you're not yeah. going to bring in that kind of state that they were in earlier in the season, you're not going to bring another field player because you're going to have to go pretty deep into the Verdos ranks to do that. So this is just, I'm, I'm triple underlining my point at this point, but it applies for Nashville. It applies for going deep on a cup run. What happens when Buanga comes up injured? Kai Kamara is injured and can't sub on for the last seven minutes of a game. 
his legendary job. Yeah. Then you put Giroux in now. So, and here's the thing I've been watching Giroux and said, yeah, and mm -hmm. he, yes, he's still Olivier Giroux, but I have doubts as to whether he has a Gareth Bale style, the one play that the club desperately mm -hmm. needs him to, to make a uh, kind right. of retirement tour. Not going to say that people are overrating LAFC, but I think people are making too much out of their absolute invincibility because their stamina is going to get hit. And that's true of some of these other teams that Austin's going to be playing. Like Galaxy, they've been going hard. You've got guys that not just, you know, for the purpose of rotating, but because they may just go too hard for the first few games out of the gate. Even some of these guys that have been playing for a while and generally know how to take care of themselves this is where they pick up dumb injuries is being rested for almost three weeks and going, okay, cool. Well, let's get that momentum game out of the way and let's go hard and let's show out and show up. And I, I feel like that being the extent of Austin's injury report bodes very well against Nashville and against the opponents to come. Meanwhile, for Nashville, Tyler Boyd's got a season ending injury. Sean Davis is out, but he hasn't really been able to get on the field that much, even though he's one of their higher paid players. Brandon Leal, Lucas McNaughton, and Drew Yearwood all out as well. But Sam Surridge is off the injury report. So it looks like he might get some time. Of course, he is their English forward that has not had quite the season that people were expecting this year, which is a running theme with Nashville. Although, Ben Wright had talked about, in particular, stark lack of service for Surridge, and that's been a lot of kind of what he's struggled about. But Josh Bauer, player to look at, got some right back minutes while Shaq Moore was over at Copa America, could be in there. Again, we don't know who's going to partner with Zimmerman, whether it's Jack Moore or whether Bauer's going to uh, nose into that. But I think that'll be, again, I think that'll be interesting. And again, uh, obviously, when you have Zimmerman anchoring the defense, uh, it's going to be a pretty good defense. But... Again, part of the, of course, story of Saturday is going to be how much is Austin going to be able to infiltrate the boat into the back line now that they've got both Bukhari and Oprion bringing the speed. Uh, I am very curious to see how they're going to deal with a team that is used to defending, that is used to controlling games on their half of the field. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what Austin does right out of the blocks. I see them starting out aggressive. I see a kick-started opening 60 seconds of play. If not, I don't know what we're in for. Yeah. I think there are phases where they will defend like it's a Liga MX team against them, like the ones that we saw. But yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I feel that, yeah, there, there are going to be some moments where they're going to try to forget, possess. They're going to try to be aggressive. They're going to try to challenge. We'll see, though. I am honestly curious, and I'm a little bit in suspense in terms of what they're actually going to do. I don't have a kind of gut necessarily that says it's going to be this way or that way. I yeah. do. I think maybe it'll be maybe it'll be a mix. Maybe it's a thing where they are more pragmatic and condensed in kind of 10 to 15 minute stretches and then they break out of that. I don't know. It's going to be it's going to be a fun one, I think. The another thing that I was just going to throw out there real quick uh, before we move on is the actual yeah. 12th man on the field, the center ref for this game, Rosendo Mendoza, is not one of the outlier type refs that we worry yeah. about. He's not a Ted uncle. Yeah. He's not an agent of chaos. He is a game managing ref who does a reasonably good job. So that's another variable that is not as, as much of a possible chaos creator as some of the other refs mm -hmm. in the rotation can be. So right. I think it'll be an interesting match. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I do too. And that's, it's fun. It's fun to have league games back. Finally, again, we've After talked about a, a lot more than other podcasts, maybe, but ML yeah, we do want MLS, wanna... MLS is league cup, uh, league, league singular. Cup now. Yes. Yes. It is the binational tournament that suddenly became mononational. So we do want to talk briefly about the MLS cup 2023 rematch in the league's cup final for 2024 it is columbus it is lafc we have seen this movie before yeah uh and it honestly feels like it's it's a rematch and also potentially a precursor of what we're gonna see in yeah. a little over three months time yeah, I know we were talking about S.H.I.E.L.D. teams. We forgot to mention Inevitable Columbus as a possibility. Yeah, Inevitable Com Columbus, who were denied a treble possibility by MLS mm -hmm. making decisions that they did surrounding Open Cup. that Denied where LAFC actually has the opportunity to win such a thing. So 
Both of those teams are definitely coming to win. Either of those teams could win it. It is, it is, I, I presaged that the worst final for Garber's liking would be a not Club America Liga MX team against Colorado yeah. or something. Colorado Mazatlan. Colorado Mazatlan. Died, but... Toluca versus, you know, Philly. <laughs> Who cares? Okay. Uh, the fine people of Philly do. Like this LAFC Columbus thing. Is it going to be a good game of soccer? Sure. Is anybody yeah. going to watch yeah. it? No. Absolutely not. It is not. I don't know. Not appointment viewing for people. I just cannot. Stay. It's not a Sunday night though. Again, what else are you doing? Standalone games on okay. Sunday. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's any counter programming. Let me look at that real quick. It is in Columbus, as the twenty three final was. Right. It's yeah. the kind of thing that it, the it it being on a Sunday night, people who already have season pass, I'm sure might go. What else am I doing? But also, unless they care about LAFC or Columbus, I could see them going. I hate both of those teams. Screw off. I'm sure. going to watch the replay of the Wrexham game that I wasn't awake to watch this morning. <laughs> uh, it, always it, back to Wrexham. So always back yeah, to there, Wrexham. There is no, yeah, there is no counter programming on Sundays. If you are really determined to see as much soccer as you possibly want to at three 30, you can catch the third place match. Yes. They have a third place match. And that is uh, Philly and Colorado. The reason that they have a third place match is because it's one more game. But also, I believe there are CONCACAF Champions Cup implications. I believe the third place team in League's Cup goes to that is how that works. I believe. I'm not 100% sure. Don't quote me. But I think that's the case. So I think they actually will play for something other than... yeah. Oh, hey, we get the bronze medal in this tournament that is still trying to find its identity several years in. Yeah, yeah. So if you're not doing anything 3.30 on a Sunday, instead of going to Luby's, fire the old Apple TV. <laughs> Luby's, huh? Yeah, Luby's. It's a thing. It's a thing. about a, a group of pals are organizing an outing because sometimes you just want that Luan platter, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I Colby has become a, a central character in this podcast but colby has always been trying to get us to go to golden corral like yeah. after a media conference Good, a golden media corral, conference. endorsed yeah. by josh wolf is oh that's some good eating golden corral that takes me back <laughs> and i'm like you out there you out there in 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 avery ranch going to the golden corral out by the lake is that is there a golden corral out by the lake josh you I have no idea i've never been inside a golden corral so have you absolutely i'm a man of the world sir okay that's 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 an experience right there watching <laughs> watching somebody scream at the person at the prime rib station because their eight-year-old doesn't have <laughs> enough prime rib or something yeah it, it is I'm a man of the world i'm a man of the world that includes north texas yeah no you gotta we're gonna make the golden corral thing happen at some point we're gonna make a whole thing oh God, of it yeah it'll be extensively yeah. reported on there will who knows mm -hmm. a fight might break out no way to know depends on the day <laughs> a fight involving one of us or just just a fight, uh, an atmospheric just a, fight, just a, an yeah. atmospheric fight. It could be a vibes fight. It couldn't, it could be that something doesn't even break out, but it's just a series of nasty looks and jockeying for position in line for that, that sweet prime rib. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this has to happen, I guess at some point, I don't know. Um, <laughs> this is the man who's tried to engineer hot wings challenges with the moon tower guys and they never quite come off. I would destroy Except for the time all. I trained. I would destroy them all. I would, yeah, I'll lay it right here, right now. If, if there is a media wing eating spiciness champ, yeah, yeah, I would challenge any of these white boys to touch me. Okay. I'm Cuban, man. The, the habanero pepper, this, I mean, it was named for my ancestors, I think. This sounds, okay, this sounds like a media Christmas party. This sounds like uh, the, this, this media is cup what, game followed media by media cup game followed by, uh, nuclear wing hot challenge. wing challenge yeah <laughs> i love it oh my god the trash oh, talk will amazing. already be at a 10 that's what it'll take it to an 11 yeah cool all right i think this is a good place to end on speculating about oh media cup games and wings yes okay what you got Zvata talk okay um just one thing so him adjusting to the heat is one thing the war in ukraine continuing the way that it has Literally within the last mm -hmm. week, Dnipro, where he played for their club, yeah. was yeah, recently yeah. like directly under bombardment. And I mean, I retweeted stuff that was coming directly from people in country 
reporting on that stuff. Mm-hmm. I think to some extent, it, it is totally reasonable for there to be a bit of a cover story of, yeah, he's getting adjusted to the heat, which then, you know, the fan base spins into, oh God, he's not working out. Oh God, he's going to be a flop. And then other people are going, oh, he was captain at his old club. He'll be Austin's captain before long. Calm down, guys. Let's Mm -hmm. actually watch him play for one. I think that there's a certain amount of sensitivity, you know, toward what folks are going through. I mean, look, we got crazy stuff going on in Venezuela too. I think that there is something to be said for, The fact that the roster has a good apportionment of center backs at the moment, that people reacting with outrage of he's been there for a month. Why isn't he starting and kicking Olivier Giroud's head off? I get the impulse. Having a little bit of empathy for folks who, you know, literally, you know, the, the city they played for, the city he's from getting bombarded, even though that's the story all across Ukraine for months and yeah. months now, there there are other things going on that is not football. And I think as much as fans, pundits would like to see Austin perform and everybody on the roster be at their peak, I just wanted to throw that out there as maybe give this guy a little bit of slack, give this guy a little bit of space as, yeah. as he is uh, probably regularly checking in with family and seeing what's going on. This is active war zone stuff, which is something that people born and raised in the United States don't have that perspective. We don't have U.S. cities suffering aerial bombardments at three in the morning with no notice and no ability to evacuate. So I just wanted to say that I look forward to the time when we are able to get media access to him and actually have something to talk to him about other than just the war or Hey, so what do you think of the weather? Hey, so what are these guys like? We know what he thinks of the weather. We know what he, he thinks like of the weather. It. He's not a fan, uh, as one would yeah. expect. A lot of us who live here aren't fans of the weather. So I, I just wanted to throw yeah, that but it out is, there. Yeah, yeah, because that's the thing. That was, yeah, that was his hometown. He was playing for that team. That team has folded shortly after he moved. Obviously, the financial situation of the team, probably a factor, but also being in a much safer place is probably also a factor. But yeah. Yeah, obviously it's he's very connected to that place and to see that happening. And again, it's it's it continues and it's awful and obviously way too many wars right now. Yeah. But ceasefires would be very nice. And I get that there are people who are very firm about feelings about national flags being displayed in the supporter mm-hmm. section. But I am I for sure. one am very glad that we have had a Ukraine flag in the supporter section since that right. conflict began. And yeah, even before a Ukrainian player. Exactly. Before a Ukrainian player, he came out at his debut saying hello to the stadium draped in the flag. That kind of thing, that kind of thing means something. That kind of thing is an important way to grow the legend, to borrow from the corporate speak. Yeah, because it's not. Yeah, because that's the thing. It's not just, hey, I'm from this place and I'm proud, but I'm from this place and it's fighting for its very existence. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah, all the best to to Ukrainians all over and yeah, Alexander yeah. Svatok Absolutely. as he continues to make this place a home and just chill chill out on him guys. Don't DM him dumb crap on Instagram. He's a ben, and hopefully he he acclimates to the heat. I, he will. He will someday he will. like Austin. I'm, tell, yeah. I'm telling you Phil, I'm you know, I am going to be I'm going to be the fun version of a conspiracy theorist. It's a cover story. He's acclimating just fine to the weather. It's just he's got some real world shit going on that, you know, is a bit of a distraction. Mm -hmm. And that is something that plays into that high performance stuff. Do you want to talk about that publicly and spread that around the fan base? And then you get the fans like inundating the guy with messages of sympathy. He's a little busy. He doesn't, he probably wouldn't mind it, but he might as he's trying to just deal with being, being a person. So yeah, I lay off the guy, calm down at the conspiracy theories, go with my conspiracy theory. It's the best conspiracy theory, the greatest, most incredible conspiracy theory, which is that the, you know, they're just trying to give the guy some space as some terrible craps going on that nobody is talking about because everybody's talking about when Beyonce is going to hit the stage of the DNC and yeah. all kinds of other stuff. People have, people are aware that conflict is still going on, but they are not as aware of the day-to-day stuff other than, oh yeah, uh, Ukraine invaded some Russian territory. Okay, cool. And that's the extent of people's awareness of what's going on out there, which I don't begrudge anybody, but it's just, that's just not what is being reported. You have to pay special extra attention 
to know some of the particulars about what's actually going on. Right. Okay. This, yeah, this took a hard turn at the end, but obviously it's important stuff to talk about. Glad we got to, glad we got to visit it. And yeah, again, with Spot Talk, obviously looking forward to seeing what he does on the field, but also definitely thinking about all those people back home yeah. for him. Yeah. So. so when you don't see him play against Nashville, other things are in play. Yeah. All right. We're going to wrap it. Thanks for being here. And we will talk to you next week with a idea of how this went and how the rest of the season might go. And then of course they're going to host Vancouver, which is, that's going to be fun again. So there's some fun stuff coming up. All right. See you next week. Where's Phil? He usually starts this off. He's teaching in San Antonio. Okay. Colby, go ahead and start us off.